Okay, we're going to start. Ladies and gentlemen, Nice turnout. All right. Yeah. Um, careful, careful. The camera. Thank you. Um, I think I know all of you. I'm JJ Surbeck, Executive Director of Team Training and Education about the Middle East. You all know that. Um, I'm not here to talk about myself or about team. I'm here to talk about a completely different topic and introduce uh, to you a different uh, speaker. However, I will mention one thing. In case some of you are not on the team mailing list, there is a, a form in the back that you can sign up with. Uh, yeah, sign, sign up to. And um, there are a couple of books in case you don't have them, but I think uh, well, most of you are uh, all hands in this business, uh, uh, as I can see. You don't need the uh, our, our elementary classes that mm, I used to give. I still give now in other places. Um, it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Professor, you go by Professor or Doctor? Dr. Doctor, Dr. Leonard Hammer. Um, I want to give credit to uh, Barbara Rakoff, who is the uh, person who made the, the connection between uh, Leonard and myself. And as she suspected, we hit it off. And uh, uh, when he told me that he was uh, doing uh, work for Shurat Hadim, uh, Hadin, I just went crazy because I think that Shurat Adin is in my book one, if not the uh, uh, Israeli organization that does the most incredible work to fight, uh, to combat terrorism and uh, the overall battle that we're engaged in um, uh, on, uh, not only on campus but in, on different issues and he'll tell you what they do. I like what they do because they're gutsy and they're smart. They go where they, they, they have a very good sense of what is the most effective way to counter some of the initiatives of the pro-Palestinians. And of course, my best example that he, well, he, he told me he would keep for last, and so I'm going to uh, <laughs> divulge a little bit. The, the second flotilla, I mean, that was a textbook example of how to do it smart mm -hmm. and gutsy. And, and they did a superb job. But anyway, he has a lot more to tell you. Uh, I don't want to go about you know, doing the lengthy introduction. You can introduce yourself. You know yourself much better than I do. So uh, maybe do, yeah, some, sometimes we, we have doubts, but ne never mind. Um, do an introduction, explain you know, who you are, what you're doing now, and your connection with Sharon Adin, and the show is yours. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Actually, I'll start out by acknowledging JJ and what a pleasure it is to get to know you and to see what you're doing here. And uh, I think, if you don't mind my acting as an Israeli mouthpiece, uh, which Israelis tend to do anyway, uh, thank you for the work you do in team and thank you for your support in general. I'm really much obliged. And now that I heard flush, we flushed out more of your history downstairs, it's really even more unbelievable. So I really am much obliged. Really, I thank you so much for all your work. Um, I should add, that in a way this is a kind of homecoming for me because believe it or not I was born here in San Diego. Uh, I didn't live here long but uh, from, what I, from what I understand the, one of the Jewish schools here was started 50 years ago uh, which gives you a, a hint of what my age is and it was my parents were one of the if you will for initiators of uh, creating the school and in fact I think this year in June they're having a 50th anniversary uh, that I'm not going to be in the States then I'll be back in Israel but my parents are going to be here so it's kind of it's kind of nice. Uh, the last time I was back in San Diego, uh, well, I left the age of like five or six, and then I think the last I was back was 25 years ago, uh, and I went to my old house, which is uh, now in a really lousy area. I don't even want to say where it is, but, <laughs> but it was just, at this time I didn't even bother going, but it was, um, so it's really nice to be back here, and I appreciate you all coming out. Uh, I know it's a, it was a semi-short notice. It's funny because by the Israeli terms, it was tons of time for you to. But in the American terms, you need like half a year or so. Well, is that a bad thing? It's fine. I'm glad that you're also active in that thing. Well, a uh, real brief background about myself because I really would like to get into the presentation. Uh, as JJ pointed out, uh, Professor, Doctor, uh, I studied actually here in the States uh, at Georgetown and at NYU for my, uh, for my JD and my master's, LLM. And then I, I have a PhD as well in law. Uh, go figure. It doesn't pay much more. Trust me by that. But I have a PhD in, in international law and international human rights uh, from University of London SOAS. Uh, if you know SOAS, it's a, a hotbed for uh, pro-Palestinian activity. I have some really interesting stories about that another time. Uh, but nevertheless, that's where I studied. And then I, I, I moved to Israel in 88. Uh, I was lucky. I clerked for a Supreme Court Justice there, Menachem Elon, who sadly passed away about two months ago. 
and I um, and then I've been also pretty lucky. I've been lecturing in different places. I now principally at Hebrew University. Uh, as you can see, I'm academic director at the at Shiradi Dean, which I'll talk about maybe later on or through the questions about exactly what I do, which might not be so clear, uh, and how I got involved. I'll talk about that later on. And, um, and I also do other type of work with the Open Society Foundation and different things, but mainly principally in democracy and human rights. And in fact, uh, that's one of my assertions, is that I got involved with an NGO culture out of the uh, DAFCA, actually because they are, uh, in my perception, a human rights organization. And that's what it's all about. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is uh, lawfare and some ways and means. And that is to look, at, look a little bit at what lawfare is all about, what it means, where it came from, and what we do at Shirat uh, leading up to, as Yeji pointed out, the flotilla itself. The, real, the, the issue really arose for us, uh, and for Israel, when I say us, I mean Israelis in general, and Shirat in particular, was how to deal with non-state actors. How to deal with individuals who are not linked to a state, individuals who have strong financial means. As you know, if you think about Al-Qaeda, if you think about other terrorist organizations that are being supported by states, that are being supported by other entities, uh, non-state entities, if you will, as well as state entities, that many times they're wealthier than the majority of states in the world. Uh, they have strong financial backing, and they have strong <coughs> means. And on the other hand, they're extremely hard to go after on a military level, on an operational, physical level. Because what happens is, at least pursuant to the structure of the Geneva Conventions, the laws of humanitarian laws of war, if you will, uh, what happens is that if you're a non-state actor, meaning that you're a non-combatant, you don't have a uniform, you're not part of any formal state system, you're not a part of a state that is a party to the Geneva Conventions, you can shoot at somebody, uh, be it a civilian, be it a soldier, and uh, during the time that you're shooting, you can be engaged as an enemy. But once you put down that rifle and you walk home and you go eat your lunch and you're going to work in your field and you're talking to your kids, uh, you're not. You're not an enemy anymore. You're not a combatant anymore. Laws, the rules of warfare don't apply to you. In fact, arguably, uh, for an Israeli soldier, for example, to go after an individual who might have attacked an Israel or a terrorist or a civilian, it's not under the context of the laws of warfare because as a non-state actor, you are not entitled to engage that individual unless they are in direct participation of hostilities, unless they're actually shooting at you or walking towards shooting at you, you know, driving somebody with a road bomb or something. Okay. And it's a real problem because what's, what's happening, what was happening was that terrorists were acting against Israel. If you guys think about in the early part of this century, a huge wave. I, I still remember that as an Israeli. We felt, uh, oh my gosh, what else is going to happen next? And then another bomb happens next week and then more people. And clearly, we're talking about bombs, we're talking about rockets. I'm, I'm including, by the way, in terrorist actions, rockets from Gaza into Israel proper. And I'm more than happy to engage that. But the bottom line is, is that it's targeting civilian centers. And one of the key definitions of terrorism is to spread terror among civilians by attacking civilians. And it's not targeting, they are not targeting, by any stretch of the imagination, military targets. So the end result is, is that when you deal with non-state actors, you're beset by an extremely perplexing issue of how to get these guys. How to, stop the, how to stop them from acting. And if they're acting with impunity, and in the sense that they know that they can shoot against you and then walk away and not be subject to, if you will, combat in the normal sense that would happen between two soldiers, if you will, or between two enemy, two enemy mil two militaries that from two, different, two different states, shall we say, or two different entities, uh, it's extremely difficult to stop these guys. And it really begs the question is how, you, how we can do that, how we can go after these guys, how we can go after the terrorists as a means of ceasing their activities. It's not just a matter of saying, yeah, I want to get you, Mr. Terrorist, because you, and don't get me wrong, I'm not happy about it, you killed 10 people, you killed 15 people, you injured 50 people with a bomb. It's a notion of how to stop it completely. And our approach has been engaging this issue of non-state actors because they are outside the realm. They are not within a rule of law context framework that we are used to thinking about. I'm saying we as an Israeli and we as, an, as Americans. And it was a big problem for us as to how to deal with it. One way of approaching it was through lawfare. Lawfare uh, actually has been around for quite some time, arguably been around for quite some time, depending on who you ask. Uh, it's been assertions of lawfare even in the 19th century, certainly in the 20th century, whereby the use of law as a means of pursuing your 
operational objectives. This is a definition provided by Charles Dunlop. Charles Dunlop was, uh, I believe, a lieutenant colonel or major in your military, in the JAG Corps. And he proposed, he still proposes, he's still around, the notion of lawfare as uh, using law as a substitute for a traditional military means to achieve an operational objective. Now, this particular definition, if you will, a proposal of engaging warfare is thinking about using law within the typical military uh, military context and military framework that might be engaged. Meaning, yeah, we're about to shoot out missiles over a town that might have an Al Qaeda operative in Afghanistan, and uh, what's legal, what's not legal. Let's go ask our JAG Corps and make sure that we're acting within legal parameters. And it partially, by the way, this partially derived from the fact that the notion of lawfare. Uh, as a means of, of legitimating the actions of the militaries because they'll now refer to some legal context. Hey, we acted properly, we looked at the laws, There's very little, there was supposed to be very little collateral damage, let's say, or we knew that the uh, operators were in there, we used the proportionate amount of response with regard to the amount of tonnage of bombs that we threw and put into the rocket or whatever it is, explosive materials that we put into the rocket, and as a result, we acted within the parameters of law. Partially, lawfare derived from actually the other side. In fact, the Taliban were extremely effective at using lawfare against the U.S. soldiers as to stimmy their actions in Afghanistan, challenging it actually in U.S. courts many times. And it was extremely frustrating, by the way, for U.S. soldiers as well, as you can well imagine. And as a result, what happened was that they came up with this idea of lawfare to say, well, if we legitimate ourselves, if we legitimate ourselves and allow to be acting within with law as an operational objective, then there's not many challenges that, that they can do against us, the U.S. Our perception of lawfare is a bit broader than that. Our perception of lawfare is it's not just a matter of achieving a military objective. It's an operational objective Dunlop's intention is within a military context. Our perception of lawfare is to engage an enemy who is a non-traditional enemy as a means of bringing justice for individuals who were injured by that non-traditional enemy. Civilians. I'm not talking about soldiers, although we do deal with the Ramallah lynching, unfortunately. But the point of it is, is that, and I can tell you about that in a second, why we do that. But the point of it is, is that we, we have expanded upon this notion of lawfare to say it's not just a matter of military. In fact, we want to move out of the military context. We don't want our kids, my kids, who have served in the military, we don't want our young kids, our young soldiers, going out there to fight a battle that they cannot win. And if they do win, it would be extremely bloody. And there'd be heavy head counts of losses on the Israeli side for sure, as well as on the other side. And the notion is, is that if we engage them as in, a, in, a, to, in a setting of a court and take them and hold the rule of law over them and over those who are supporting them, and that's really the linchpin, then we could cut them off at the head. Our mantra is bankrupting terror one case at a time. And our notion is that if we cut off terror funding, if we cut off terror support, if we make it an it inherently illegitimate type of action that is meant to be taken, and I'm talking about inherently illegitimate type of action is meant to be taken within a rule of law context, that's extremely important to assert, then the support that is given towards terrorism will be hindered. Thus far, we've been around since about 2001, 2002, thus far, We've won in judgments, one, oh, $1.3 billion. Wow. We've frozen $500 million. And we've collected for terror victims close to $130 million. And there's more to come. Wow. That's one of our key next goals is to work on enforcement actions as a means of taking these cases that have about $800, billion, $800 million outstanding and going after the money that has been dispersed throughout <clears throat> different parts of the world, not just in the United States. And I'll amplify that as I go through the, the election. I have here, can it assist Israeli security or hinder it? In this particular sense, it can be either way. Because what happened for a very long period of time was lawfare was being used against Israel. Oh, you didn't follow Judea Conventions. Oh, you didn't do this. Oh, oh we're going we're gonna to sue you because, uh, in, in, before the International Criminal Court. That's the new, the new hot topic, which of course I'll touch upon. And of course we're dealing with it. Uh, but our assertion is, is that we're taking lawfare beyond just the notion of military and moving it into what I would call a human rights context of justice for the individuals who were injured. Because that's the bottom line. Civilians were injured. Civilians were killed. 
It's not so easy when you lose your husband or lose your wife or your child to a terrorist attack. And there's a lot of significance to that. And it's a notion of, well, what do you do next? How do you go after these guys? And that was part of our dealing with that frustration is that we wanted to focus on that, which is, of course, focusing on Israeli security, first and foremost. And you know, not getting into the peace process and not getting into how to deal with your neighbor. I'm talking about the notion of security. People ask me, hey, Leonard, how would you deal with the peace process? They ask me that after I give a speech. That didn't talk anything about the peace process, but people want to know. And my answer is, I want security. I want security for my kids. I want security for me. I want to be sure I can walk down my streets and that I'm not going to be attacked by a terrorist in a civilian context, in a civilian framework, in a civilian area, Ben Yehuda Mall, Merkaz Arabi Shiva, whatever it might be. And then we could talk about peace. Then we could talk about engagement, which is not an issue on today, but I want you to be aware of the focus on Israeli security that's extremely important to Shirat Adin. And like I said, the focus on terrorism. And I'll elaborate upon the different methods that exist. I know that you had asked me that as well in the US law, the different methods that exist in a second. But it's important to recognize that, again, it's the attack on the head of the terrorist, the attack on the support that's going to the terrorists. We also do other things. And I want you to be aware of that too, and I'll elaborate upon that towards the end. But I want to give you other examples of what we do with regard to Israeli terrorists, Israeli, ter um, sorry, dealing with terrorism. One is the uh, Facebook example. Uh, and that was as follows. Uh, interesting case. Uh, Hamas basically opened up a Facebook page. And it was under the name of somebody else, but it was, what it was, what it did is it had a link in, in the, on the Facebook page to make donations to Hamas, in essence. And we wrote to Facebook and we said, you realize that, you know, you are allowing for support of terrorism through your web page, through your Facebook page, you, better, you have to shut it down. Otherwise, we're going to sue you. We're going to sue you under U.S. law. Mm -hmm. Not only will we sue, uh, sue you under U.S. law, we'll sue you as a viol violator of U.S. law and hold you accountable for terrorist actions that were conducted by Hamas, which we can do under the law, uh, as a result of your allowing for support to be given to Hamas through the Facebook web page. Mm -hmm. And they actually did shut it down in the end, by the way. Uh, not in a rather begrudging manner, but it was the notion of saying is, you know, they weren't always aware of what was going on. And that's something that we discovered is when we go to corporate uh, individuals, when we go to banks, we go to many times because they are literally supporting terror. Now, I'll, I'll elaborate upon this, I promise. They don't realize that they're doing that. They don't realize it's a violation of the U.S. law. And even more so because, of course, money talks. Uh, when you hit the pocketbook, they don't realize that we're going to see that for hundreds of millions of dollars if they continue these type of actions. And it's been semi-effective in the sense of cutting off the financial uh, capacities, if you will, of terror organizations and of places like Hamas, uh, organizations, excuse me, like Hamas, like the PFLP and like the Islamic Jihad, who are all going out and, and conducting terrorist actions against Israel. The VAT issue is an interesting one. I'll just mention the facts because it's just kind of a kind of an odd, odd type of event that we were, we were shocked was happening. We discovered that the VAT is like value-added tax. It's sort of similar to, I guess, your state tax or state sales tax, something like along those lines. And um, what happens is that when the cars are, cars are sold up, are sold or given, uh, sold to Gaza, let's call it that, we collect taxes under, pursuant to the Oslo Accords. We collect taxes and then we give it over to Hamas, which really rankles us, by the way. But, it's part of the deal. Okay. What was happening was, and by the way, when I'm talking about cars, uh, what, this is what got our attention. We're not talking about beat up, you know, old jalopies or the old uh, 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 love bug type of cars. We're talking about Mercedes, Lexus, uh, BMW, BMWs, uh, really nice cars. And not, this is not, uh, these are not like little, uh, this clearly somebody's buying a lot of cars and cars. <laughs> Very expensive ones. So what was happening was we found out is that they were, when the cars were going into Gaza, Hamas was taking out VAT, uh, close to 20%, and then they'd go to Israel and say, ah, we also want VAT from you guys because you guys collected it at the border as well. And Israel was giving them, so they were in essence making double VAT on each car, close to 40%. So we said to Israel, okay, you want to do that, but that's, a, that's considered a support of terrorism. You're violating your own Israeli law because you're giving them double beyond what they're meant to be getting. And again, they had to alter the whole system, and it, it kind of, again, it's the notion of pulling the plug out in Hamas and what they do. I'll take questions at the end, but if you don't understand, please go ahead, by all means. No, no, I'm just, I'm just, 
<laughs> are you just stretching? Just oh, you should know something. I have a very Pavlovian reaction to anybody who puts their hand above the shoulder. <laughs> because I love it when my students ask me questions during my lectures. I forgot to mention, I'm visiting lecture at University of Arizona Judaic Studies. So I, uh, especially American kids are not, and Israeli kids, you know, talking all the time. It's awesome. But American kids are very hesitant, very reticent. So I, you know, I, I make a deal with them. If you raise your hand above the shoulder, so excuse me. They, they never scratch their heads ever in my class. <laughs> in any case. I'll so they, some questions, but later. Hundred percent. So these are the these are the other examples of what we do. Many types of issues that we take out in the Israeli context as well as in, in America that deal with uh, deal with addressing the support being given to terror groups and also, to be quite frank, ways in which they're supporting themselves that we try to go after. In the U.S. context, you have two two key laws. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other ones. Actually, a very interesting Supreme Court case came out. Uh, I think it was. I don't know if it was from your newsletter. I saw it in the American Society of International Law. Uh, Supreme Court case about the alien tort statute. I'm not going to talk about that, but it's, it was limiting the capacity of, of a particular statute, a very, very old statute from, that's on your record books that have been used also to, we've used also to address aspects regarding terror. Uh, but we've now switched over to the Anti-Terror Act and the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. In the, I'll deal with the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act first. It's a bit easier. The notion of sovereign immunity is that a state is, in essence, immune from suit. Not if it's engaged in a commercial action, meaning if it's buying, let's say, you know, whatever it's panels for a building or for whatever it might be. That's already, that's good. commercial action. There's no immunity. But in general, any other actions of state that are being done, uh, there's an immunity uh, for that particular state, for that particular uh, sovereign, if you will. Uh, to allow them to conduct their actions, basically. You don't want to head to state, let's say from Africa, coming to America, and be subject to lawsuits because it stimulates their capacity to act as a public figure. Very nice. However, if a state is sponsoring terrorism, <clears throat> then there is an exception to the sovereign immunity, and that's, by the way, an exception that's recognized as well in the European context. And so I have to mention that because, of course, the great European Union. Uh, but sadly, uh, and JJ, no offense, of course, to your fellow Europeans, but sadly, the European Union regs are not always implemented. In fact, they're, it's an, it strikes me as an abject failure in many respects outside of the economic context, but that's another lecture as well. But nevertheless, the notion of sovereign immunity is uh, suspended, is removed if a state is supporting terrorism, and that's one of the key grounds that we've used against Syria and that we've used against Iran. Syria and Iran are key support. Were, maybe Syria, maybe we could use past tense now or no tense because nobody knows where they stand today and who's controlling what, uh, uh, which of course goes over into Israel sometimes as well. But the notion is, is that uh, we also, it's extremely important for us to go after, after states that are supporting terror. And I have to point out, Iran at one stage, about a year and a half ago, stopped uh, providing funds to Hamas. It started again about eight to 10 months ago. And in fact, it's giving more than it was giving in the past. We got $20 million, about $20 million a month. And it goes up and down. And the truth is, to be quite frank, it's, it, it's very hard for them to get the funds into Gaza because there's no bank that's going to touch a Hamas account nowadays. I'll tell you that right now. I'm not saying that we take credit for that, but I'm saying is that the banks are aware of the issues and the ramifications of allowing for that extra $20 million a month is nothing to a bank that's moving a trillion dollars a month or a week and uh, that might be subject to a $300 million lawsuit. So they're very wary, they're very cautious as to allowing for Hamas funds. Uh, but, uh, just give me one second, but the notion of the, not the notion, but the reality of states supporting terror is extremely stark and, and, and there. Wasn't also Norway giving money to? As, to NGOs, to non-governmental, yeah. we'll get to that in a second. Okay. We didn't go after Norway because it's not, the, the uh, connection is not as, not as direct. Uh, I, and I don't want to go too much into the Israeli laws with regard to NGOs. It's, it's rather controversial. We did, however, we did, however, uh, file. This is uh, just to demonstrate what, what we're doing. Is we now have an Australian lawyer in the office. He discovered, and we had. I still remember we had the interns working on this as well last summer. He discovered that the Foreign Ministry of Australia, which is like your State Department, uh, was providing about twenty million dollars a year to an NGO. Uh, located in uh, the West Bank, and uh, when we scratched the surface a little bit more, we found out that that is actually a Hamas-run organization, mm -hmm. and the money was going to Hamas. So we actually went to the foreign ministry, and their first reaction was, no, look at the documents. 
they're registered as a, as a, as an abuta, as a nonprofit organization under Israeli law, and we said <laughs> it was hilarious. So we said to them, "Yeah, you're right, but it's a different name. <laughs> they were giving to a different group entirely, and it, it's unbelievable. No due diligence, no due diligence whatsoever." And Andrew and Akiva Hamilton, uh, the Australian, was working on it. It actually came to the point that they had congressional, if you will, uh, parliamentary hearings, congressional hearings about the actions of the foreign minister. Of course, they stopped the funding. I mean, but it was the, the foreign minister was saying, "No, it wasn't me. It wasn't me," and nobody was taking responsibility. Actually, they literally had parliamentary hearings in Australia as a result of what was uncovered. I'm not going to assert that you know that was the cause of the downfall of Australia of the Australian government that overturned, but who knows? But the point of it is, is that it, it's another example of making actors aware of what's out there, what they're doing, and stimming, preventing the funds from, from moving forward. The Anti-Terror Act is a little bit more direct and, and really plays to, if you will, plays to our, uh, uh, con uh, our, our desires. And the Anti-Terror Act basically says is that anybody providing quote-unquote material support for a terror group uh, is subject to, in essence, subject to liability, similar to like the RICO statutes. If you know the RICO statutes dealing with uh, mobsters, uh, the idea is to connect them all because they're so, you know, they were really shrewd, interconnected, and, you know, one running, running one over the other and disconnecting one from the other. So the RICO statutes are these broad statutes that allow for suits against, basically against mobsters. Uh, and what happened was the Anti-Terror Act was kind of patterned on that, on that idea. And the notion of material support has been defined by your Supreme Court in Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, a case from 2010 that basically says uh, any type of material support in a broad sense of support for an organization will subject you to being subject, uh, subject you, sorry, to a breach of the law. You'd be considered to being a violator, violating, sorry, the law itself. The example of Holder is quite interesting because there it was Tamil Tigers, uh, which have since disbanded, and PKK, which have kind of since disbanded. I don't know what will happen, but at least a month ago they declared that they were willing to lay down their arms Hopefully it'll happen to us as well. Uh, that, but that, that's the Kurds. I'm sorry. That's the Kurds. The Kurds. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, you're right. I, I just assumed that. Yes, that is the Kurds. Correct in Turkey, of course, because they're in three or four different in countries. Five countries. Correct. Uh, in fact, it's a very funny story. It was I was going to Kyrgyzstan, and a friend of mine thought I'm going to Kurdistan, which is kind of an autonomous region, but it's not its own sovereign territory yet. And he goes, "Why are you going to Kurdistan? It's crazy. Why are you going there?" Of course, Kyrgyzstan is nothing much better, by the way, but nevertheless. In any case, uh, yes, so the PKK are the Kurds. And uh, what happened there was, this is the irony, was it was Stanford Law Project were sending out their law students to teach the PKK and the Tamil Tigers about the Geneva Conventions and humanitarian law to make them more legitimate actors. And the Supreme Court said, sorry, boys, that's considered a material support for a terror organization. The notion of material support is extremely broad, and by the way, it, it, the case went to the Supreme Court because there were some circuits that, of course, we filed in that said provided a very broad notion of material support, i.e., financial institutions, like I just mentioned, corporate actors, like I just mentioned, allowing for accounts to flow through, Facebook, like I just mentioned, which the breadth of it, whether it really does include Facebook or not, is another issue entirely, meaning a legal issue, which lawyers have to make a lot of money from, of course. But it's the notion, it's the fact that Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project provided this rather broad concept of what material support means allows us then to go ahead and say, look, you are going to be in violation of the anti-terror act. Um, more than happy to take it to court. We'll, we'll try it out. Let's go try it out. And what happened was that prior to the Supreme Court decision, so there were some circuits that were providing a, a broad interpretation, and some dismissed our suits saying, "Is no, it, there's no material support here. It's too attenuated. Uh, Bank of China is not connected. All these different things." And the end result is, is that we have the Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, which supports the cases to say is that we can go against, for example, Bank of China, for example, UBS, again, no offense to the Swiss, uh, <laughs> I think you're happy, you're happy about that, uh, because they were allowing for accounts to be, uh, money to be channeled through for clear terrorist accounts. And it was, it was really quite apparent what they were doing. So the Anti-Terror Act is really quite broad and provides a platform uh, for us to then act against terror organizations. And like I said, the mantra being to bankrupt terror one case at a time. And that's really what it's all about. Which leads us, of course, to the flotilla issue. Flotilla, number one, uh, happened in 2010. I'm not sure you're aware of it. Uh, it was when the boats came to Gaza. Uh, 
presumably with humanitarian aid. A uh, couple of provisos. One is, uh, I, what I found very interesting about the post flotilla number one is that Israel, for almost, I wouldn't say it's the first time, but it's very rare uh, that Israel says they were willing to work. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. We were willing to work with the UN uh, on, on the high seas to check boats coming in. And then we said, okay, if, if it's good, as long as we get to inspect with the UN, we'll allow it to happen. And the Palestinians said, no, we don't want that. That's not good enough. The world, Palestinians, Turkey, I don't know who exactly said it, but they, they rejected it outright. I was shocked when Israel agreed, by the way. To, it was awesome, don't get me wrong, it's great. But I was shocked that they were willing to do that. And uh, it was just summarily rejected. Okay, so we have the flotilla. You guys know about what happened. Uh, three or four boats, the Magi Marmara, which, by the way, I was always amazed at this. Marmara Marmara was an ex-cruise ship. Uh, uh, just footnote, I made Aliyah by boat from Barry, Italy to Israel. Back then, they still had these kind of like fake cruises where you sleep on the ship for like 10 bucks and you get into the port. It was great. If someone was coming up at the Fife, I entered the port and made Aliyah that way. Uh, and I still remember, it was, that, it was that type of ship. You know, they have like, yeah, we have, a, we have a pool on board, but it was one of those like round circles about this big. You jump into it, it's a bit warm, and you jump out. So that was Mavi Mamara. It cost about $750,000. Somebody purchased it for this particular <laughs> human rights organization. Go figure. They own the boat. Okay, very nice. And they were coming in in the Mavi Mamara. Sadly, we stopped them. By the way, uh, footnote again, and I have to throw in a little bit of international law so you're aware of, of what Israel was doing. Uh, under international law, there's no doubt that you are allowed to engage in a naval blockade, particularly against uh, your enemy. Uh, as we know, Hamas is not, <laughs> forget recognizing Israel, has called for the eradication, which is by, vir by virtue of any type of definition is deemed to be a, a declaration of war against the state. And we, we are allowed to engage in a, in a naval blockade. Uh, yes, we, are, we are, do let through humanitarian aid. We do let through, through food, obviously. We let through cars as well. And uh, the engagement of these boats in the high seas is also allowed under international law, law of the sea, because if you are a state that has a naval blockade, uh, and it's apparent, and it was extremely apparent, that there is going to be a breach of that blockade, you're allowed to engage the ships on the high seas, just for the record. Uh, just so you know, understand what I'm getting at. This, let's say this is Israel. Here's a territorial sea that's considered about 12 nautical miles. That's considered part of Israel's land. You might have the exclusive economic zone that's uh, for fishing and things, but it's a bit more open to allowing boats in. And then, of course, you have the high seas, which is meant to be for everybody in the world to pass through. That's why you know drug, drug you know, cocaine lords and always running out to a couple hundred miles, you know, on their yachts and living out in the sea. They're outside of the jurisdiction of any state, so they can sort of, you know. Pirates. Well, the piracy is considered international crime, so it's universal jurisdiction. In any case, unfortunately, they, we stopped the ships. Unfortunately, uh, we had our soldiers uh, rap rappelled down. They were holding paint guns, paintball guns. Uh, they did not foresee, uh, sadly, uh, one could argue, and it, it does seem the way they were not properly uh, um, uh, prepared for what was going to happen. They were young kids. There were 19 and 20 year olds uh, of our soldiers out there. They were just si simply not mentally ready for what happened. They went down with paint guns. They shot back uh, with paint guns. They were then attacked by the mob. And I'll, there's at least the Israeli facts. And they, uh, and, and sadly they shot into the crowd and they killed nine civilians. We know, I guess it's been now about a month ago, during Obama's visit, we had Netanyahu calling up Erdogan and uh, offering an apology. Uh, we at Shirad Adin felt uh, that an apology, okay, if you want to do that, but he should have also requested for removal of the civil cases, lawfare, parentheses, that have been filed against the Israeli soldiers uh, uh, on behalf of the victims, uh, some of which were Americans. In fact, I have down here neutrality at question mark because one, one of our approaches of dealing with the flotilla, uh, among many other things, I don't even want to go into all the other things that we tried to do, was to say under the Neutrality Act, the Neutrality Act is an act passed by, believe it or not, George Washington. And what it says is, it's a very old act, and it says is that if you are an American citizen and you're supporting, uh, and, I'm sorry, you're acting against an ally of the United States, a declared ally of the United States, you're in violation of the law. You're in violation of the Neutrality Act. There were two Americans on the ship, I think three even, uh, and, uh, and we were thinking of, of invoke, trying to have the Attorney General invoke the Neutrality Act, which wasn't gonna happen, but it was just different ideas, again, of thinking about working our way through the laws that exist um, and, and thinking about ways of, of trying to deal with it. We had a uh, Turkel committee uh, subsequent to the, to the flotilla incident. It took about, I guess it took about eight months, January uh, uh, 2011, to, 
when it submitted its report. So Kel was an ex-Supreme Court justice. We have committees that are kind of part of the checks and balances in our system. Uh, it's similar to kind of your Senate or congressional hearings. In, in a way, they're a little bit more heavy, I'd say. Uh, and usually we have an ex-Supreme Court justice and other individuals as well. I think we had Alan Baker, if I'm not mistaken, sitting on there, as well as some, a district court judge. I forgot who she was, but he, they were on there. And they basically said, it's like I was saying to you, not of course that I was on the committee, but you know, is the takeover was legal under international law, was on, even though it was on the high seas, because they were, had the intention of reaching the blockade. Uh, they did criticize the IDF uh, preparation beforehand and uh, the operation itself in terms of the fact that, uh, sadly, there were nine civilian deaths uh, that occurred. And you can well imagine this is an extremely frustrating uh, 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 action for Israel. And it's, again, indicative of having non-state actors acting on behalf of a terrorist organization like Hamas, which, by the way, under U.S. law, under European law, and yes, under European law, and under Israeli law, obviously, Hamas is a terrorist organization. That's what it's deemed. You want to change it, you can change the law. That's our assertion. But they're not deemed to be freedom fighters. These are individuals who intend to and do attack civilians with the intent of killing them. It's not a joke. These rockets are out to do damage. They're not there to sort of miss the towns. They don't want to miss the towns. I can tell you that right now. It's not their intention. Interesting, sub interesting story with the first flotilla I was, at the I was at the time doing academic work for about two years in northern Cyprus and in Ankara and Turkey. I just can't avoid occupied territories or uh, disputed areas. Uh, I was in north Cyprus uh, uh, doing work there. I also, by the way, I do work in Azerbaijan, so there's in the Garna Karabakh, another occupied area that we didn't discuss. But so there's always, I just can't avoid it. I'm going to go to the Western Sahara next. And I want to go to Tibet. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I did another comparative study on that in academia, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, but it was interesting was that I was flying from Turkey, Istanbul, and, uh, uh, yes, Istanbul, to, uh, to England, to UK. And I still remember this. We were sitting on the tarmac for about 45 minutes. And this is about three weeks, three or four weeks after the flotilla of 2010. And then all of a sudden, uh, about 13 people come in, young kids, 23, 25, and uh, they're all scurrying around looking for empty seats. And I was golden because I had a two-seater and there was no one next to me. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a great flight. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, this young girl sits down. She's wearing a hijab, beautiful English accent from London, like really upper crust stuff. And uh, so she sits down next to me. I go, oh, what's going on? She goes, oh, we were on the flotilla. I go, what are you talking about? She goes, well, what happened was that um, after the flotilla, uh, the, uh, they were arrested by Israel, then they sent us back to Turkey. Turkey put us up in a hotel, and then they're flying us back to wherever we came from, which most of the kids were from UK and some were from Europe as well. I mentioned the Americans, I think they stayed on. Uh, I said, oh wow, that's, I read about that. What, what was going on there? So she said as follows, she said, well the Israelis repelled out of the helicopter uh, with their guns, machine guns, blazing at us, and we ran to hide behind plastic chairs, and, uh, and, and then they came down and started shooting at us. I said, well, uh, why, why would they do that? What, what's, what's the story there? Why would they do that? She goes, because every single IDF soldier wants to kill us. That's their, that's, their, that's their intended purpose. So I said to her, you know, if they wanted to kill you, they would have shot a missile at your boat and just watch you sink into the sea. They don't want to kill you. She goes, no, I'm telling you that's what happened. I'm just saying that it's because, you know, obviously I don't believe her, but it's just so interesting to hear perceptions of people that were there and how they perceive the actors that are, ha you know, the actions happening literally before our eyes. It's the old evidence uh, case, evidence uh, example that we give in the laws of evidence of, you know, you have a, lot, you have a uh, traffic accident at, at, at a busy corner and there's five people watching it and they all have five different stories. So I don't know if it's that extreme, but it was just so interesting to hear her perception of how she saw the world in a way. Well, in any case, so it comes around June, around June 2011. This is actually it was already uh, April and May, and there's a talk of another flotilla. But this time, the talk of the flotilla was to say, not three or four boats. We're gonna have 20. We're gonna have 30 boats come because we're gonna breach the blockade and we're gonna bring that those chocolates over to the children in Gaza and whatever else they had in there. I don't want to talk about. And uh, Israel was really was really beset with the quandary. Uh, our, our Navy, yes, our Navy's semi-strong. Obviously, we're not a naval power. We don't have an aircraft carrier. We have a couple of submarines, I think six now, that we have uh, 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 nuclear, we have, actually have nuclear subs as well. Uh, but in general, we're not considered a naval power. It's not a focus. Obviously, it's there for, for border. We're actually lucky that we don't have to send our soldiers out to another country. I, I 
thank, thank God for that every day. I speak to the soldiers here uh, and students and, and just speaking to people, and it's, it's really hard to go away for a year and a half from your family or eight months or ten months. In any case, what, what would you do? And it was really tough. It was really hard to figure out what to do. And, and everybody was nervous about it because it would either be another humanitarian disaster, and I, I hope you guys know we don't want to kill. I, I hope that's patently clear. We don't want to kill people. We don't want to kill civilians by any stretch of imagination. And I would even assert, on a certain level, we don't want to kill our enemies if we don't have to. And I say that because, like I said, I have, I have three kids, two are in the Army, and you know I talk to them all the time about what you're told and what kind of training you receive. And you know one of them's a combat soldier, one of them's training to be a combat soldier, so they're not, they're not just you know, sitting behind a desk. And it, they're told to do certain things in a certain way as a means of attempting to uphold the Geneva Conventions. It's not... It's not a free-for-all. And we thought of different approaches. And one approach was to say as follows. What's happening here? Flotilla is being sent to Gaza. What's the point of the flotilla? To support a Hamas-controlled area. What we did is we went to the uh, insurance companies, and we said to them is, if you pay insurance on those ships, and by the way, on the maritime law, you are required to have maritime insurance, otherwise you won't be able to leave dock. It's just the way it works. For obvious reasons, you're talking about huge pieces of machinery <laughs> that can cause a lot of damage, and that also obviously are worth money. Maritime law is it demands that, and is in essence a consortium of insurance companies. Of course, laws of Lloyd's of London has been one of the key old school English controlling of the sea type of issues, and Lloyd's of London being this institution that's been around for obviously many years, although at one point it's close to bankruptcy. But in any case, uh, and we went to the insurance com companies and we said to them is, if you guys provide insurance to these ships, we're going to sue you for being in breach of the Anti-Terror Act and any type of terror action that was supported by Hamas, you will be held liable for under U.S. law. Uh, and uh, they actually did not provide insurance to these ships. We then went to Inmarsat, which is the satellite technology in essence, without it, a ship would probably go around in a circle because it wouldn't know where it is relative to the rest of the Earth. It's a huge body of water. There's no, there's a tree over there. Make a right. You know, you don't know what you're going to do next. So, so they have they have to rely on Inmarsat. Inmarsat's the only game in town for satellite technology tracking systems. And what we did is we wrote to them and we said is that if you guys provide Inmarsat technology to these ships, we're going to also we're going to sue you for being as material supporters of a terrorist group. And we're going to hold you liable for supporting Hamas, for supporting a, a terror, a terror uh, group. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me just finish this one, and then I'll, I'll take it. Uh, and uh, we did other things, too. We discovered that, just as an example, uh, we don't just sit back. We, we try to push it. We discovered that, uh, and this actually is, is Avi discovered this, uh, the executive director, Avi Nitsana of, of Shirat Adin, uh, that the head of the Coast Guard, where the ships were docked in Greece, was an ex-MP, an ex-member of parliament in Greece, in the, Greece, in the Greek member of, uh, parliament, which at the time wasn't bankrupt. And, uh, and, they, and he was a big supporter of Israel, apparently. So what we did is we got hold of this guy, and we said, look, you've got to help us. You've got to help us delay these ships from leaving. And what he did is he sent his inspectors down to the ships, and they checked the ships, and they discovered, you're always going to discover administrative problems with ships. There's no way a ship's going to be spot 100% clean unless you're really OCD, <laughs> which then you shouldn't be running a ship. <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and he discovered, he delayed them for three or four days to allow us to, to move forward these letters to the insurance company. It was all this type of effort going on. And it was met with great success. And they actually didn't sail in the end. None of the ships sailed. I wouldn't say it's as a result of us, but we certainly were. I still remember this because <clears throat> we had people tell us from meetings, governmental meetings, who were privy to these governmental meetings, saying it's, it's unbelievable that, you know, Lucky Shirat Adin helped us stop these, these ships from coming because they, there was really no, no policy. It was really unclear how to deal with it. Uh, you had a question, please. That's a huge success. Thanks. I was wondering, how broad is it when you say that, they're, that, for instance, the insurance carriers are going to be held responsible for terrorist acts that fall out. How broad are those terrorist acts that fall out from whatever Hamas may do? Uh, it's not a, a good question. It's not a matter of the, the terrorist acts themselves. I, I, well, I, I, I'm sorry, I'll clarify uh -huh. that. If a terrorist, sadly, attacks an individual, and let's say it's an American, expat American who lives in Israel, just to make it easier for jurisdictional issues, 
uh, uh, that's, that's a terrorist attack, right? And that group that conducted the terrorist attack uh, clearly, uh, you know, we have, to, we have to demonstrate responsibility, which isn't always so easy. We have to demonstrate a connection between the terrorist itself, him, him or herself, sadly nowadays, and the particular organization. Now, obviously, for us to sue that terrorist or the organization would be a complete waste of time because no pockets, no, you know, there's no, they don't have much money, and how, we wouldn't even be able to acquire jurisdiction. However, and this is, I think, is going to answer your question. However, if there is support for that terrorist group, not necessarily for that terrorist act, and this is where the law is, is very interesting in that sense that it allows for any type of material support given to that group, you are then responsible, similar to the RICO statutes, you're then responsible for all the actions of that group. That's where the RICO statutes come in as, as, a, as an assistance. So if you're a bank, for example, uh, you are al and allowing for funds to go through, you're being held responsible. And the notion is, again, to stimmy, to stop the funding. And it's the idea of bankrupting terrorism, one, one case at a time. And that's really what we're trying to do. Obviously, Flotilla, we, we took it a step further, and we do other things as well with regard to Israeli security. That's extremely central to, to what we're trying to do, is to protect us. And, and, and in, in a legitimate manner, in a manner that, <clears throat> Flotilla in particular, nary a shot was fired, right? Nobody was killed. Nobody had to die. And thankfully, we didn't have to put our young soldiers at risk. And, we, and no resources of Israel were even used, just a bunch of letters and fa you know, faxes, if you will. So that's really the connection, that's the breadth, if you will, the scope of the, of the law itself, and that allows us to do these operations. I'll just mention two other things that we do, and then one other minor point, and that is uh, International Criminal Court. I promised you I'd talk about it, so I have to talk about it. International Criminal Court, um, I'm not sure of the time, actually. Where do I stand time-wise? Is it uh, quarter to eight? Another 15 minutes, yes. Okay, good. And then Q&A. Right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Q&A, I know. Mm -hmm. That's part of the fun. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, basically, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, w uh, the Palestinian Authority filed an action, uh, a request to the, uh, to the uh, if you will, Attorney Gen Chief Prosecutor, Attorney General of the ICC to issue indictments. It's kind of a lengthy process. And that was in 2008, retroactive to 2005 to include Operation Cast Lead uh, and the uh, presumed actions that Israel did. Um, uh, uh, obviously, I'm not going to even refer to the Goldstone Report because that would be totally <laughs> ridiculous. I've actually had references to people come up to me to ask, what about the Goldstone Report? I go, what about the Goldstone Report? I mean, it's, um, it's like saying, what about the Protocols of Elders of Zion? <laughs> Seriously, I'm not kidding around. It's so, it's, it became so delegitimized that it's like... It's almost, I, if I was a UN person, I'd be really embarrassed. In any case, um, the, and there's no offense to the ICRC either. Oh, I know. Go ahead. Uh, the, um, uh, what happened was is that the, uh, so they, they wanted to ret they retroactive back to ca uh, Castlet. 2000 and, I think 2012, prior to the, or 2011, 2012, I think it was, prior to the uh, Palestinian Authority becoming a permanent member, uh, sorry, observing, observing, uh, observing, observing member of, sorry, the United Nations, uh, the chief prosecutor dismissed the, uh, the, re the request, saying is you're not a state, you're not a party to the ICC, you can't be a party to the ICC. However, if you were observing member of the United Nations, maybe we'll think about it, type of thing. Kudos to the chief prosecutor, remove politics from the, from the, from the, from the, uh, from the evaluation. Uh, uh, I think he's a, of Spaniard uh, origin, and actually rather impressive, truth told, rather impressive international criminal lawyer. Uh, I think it's Argentinian. Oh, he's Argentinian? Yeah, yeah. I, I knew it was of Spanish origin, yeah, but yeah, right. he, actually you're right, he is Argentinian, mm -hmm. now that I think about it, yes. Right. I think that now replaced is not another chief prosecutor, Correct. so it would be interesting to see what happens. Palestinian Authority, of course, as we know, receives observer status in the United Nations. Uh, it's that old joke uh, that we make in Israel, I think it was again Abba Iban, I'm not sure who, which one, uh, who says that if, if the General Assembly was told that we could criticize Israel and declare the moon to be made of cheese, they would vote to accept it. So it's. It's the old, you know, it wasn't so much of a surprise for Israel. Um, and presumably, the ICC is going to, I'm sorry, the Palestinian Authority will reissue uh, a request for an indictment against Israel on the basis of actions, particularly in Castlet. So we have been thinking about this a lot. And uh, uh, we now have engaged in a campaign in, in Hebrew, in Israel. Uh, it translates kind of poorly, but in is Hebrew makes a little bit more sense. What it's sort of saying is, will terrorize the PA in the, in the ICC if they try to terrorize us. And the notion is, is that if they, and we've, we've, 
we're very clear about this, and, and I can tell you right now as an international lawyer, we have really strong grounds here. If they sue against us in the ICC, we will sue them, or obviously put in a request. As an NGO, by the way, is allowed under the ICC, ICC statute to put a request into the chief prosecutor. So you don't need to be a state, but you need to be from an area that's subject to the ICC jurisdiction in this case, uh, being that they're trying to invoke jurisdiction against Israel, so they're invoking jurisdiction against themselves. They don't realize that. I don't think they realize that in 2008. They might now. So they're kind of opening up this huge Pandora's box that says, okay, sue Israel for minor, not minor, obviously people died and not belittling at all, but I am saying is they were, I don't, do not think that the Israeli actions achieve the level of what's called, under the ICC statute, serious war crimes. No way is it crimes against humanity. Uh, no way could you call it uh, could, uh, genocide. Uh, it, it doesn't even reach that level of intent, and, and, and thank God, I don't think it ever will. But uh, uh, by comparison, the war crimes being conducted in Hamas, an area that's a, presumably affiliated with the PA, and the area that they're focusing on for Operation Cast Lead, uh, are way worse. And in fact, they're subject, opening themselves up for huge indictment requests by us, and I imagine by other organizations, unless, I don't know if anybody will do anything else, uh, as a means of dealing with actions before the International Criminal Court. And it's extremely important to us. The other uh, focus that we've been having lately is on BDS, the uh, uh, um, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement. And uh, we're, we're thinking of doing different things under the law. Actually, part of what I do, I created a CLE course, Continuing Legal Education course, on anti-boycott law, uh, which is really, really interesting history here in the United States. And uh, uh, arguably, on their anti-discrimination law, uh, to conduct, uh, it, depending obviously on which, who's doing the BDSing, if you will, who's doing the sanctioning and investment, uh, is, uh, they are subjecting themselves to, in essence, your 1964 Civil Rights Act, which is copied, obviously, by almost every, by every single state here in the United States. So under state law, uh, by engaging in a BDS, if you are the correct body, i.e. a public body, uh, you can interpret that as a violation of the Civil Rights Act, believe it or not. Kind of an interesting one there. So that's kind of our focus. Now, people don't realize BDS is, is actually quite damaging to Israel, uh, even though uh, it might take an incremental level economically, uh, but, and I'm not even talking about the academic, I'm talking about just the damage to Israel that occurs. On a, and forget even Hasbara, but damage, long-term damage that will occur to Israel as, as a result of BDS. And you can ask SodaStream. And you know that's been accepted already in the European Union context of, of allowing for states like Germany, by the way, a uh, famous case for the European Court of Justice with regard to SodaStream to to uh, to to uh, a boycott uh, the sale of SodaStream uh, in in Germany uh, because of where the where the plant is located. Uh, well, that's a very small piece of what we do. Uh, we're a small office. We have uh, we've actually recently hired. Uh, on part-time basis to U.S. attorneys to assist us with the litigation here. We have a, a lawyer here who works on contingency, basically. He's a really good guy. Uh, we obviously work with him. Avi, in particular, is a, uh, a well-known criminal appell appellate attorney. Uh, and then we have two lawyers in, in, in America, uh, three, excuse me, three in, in, in Israel that are of, who, whom are of American origin uh, from different parts of the country. And now they made Aliyah, thankfully, and they, they they, they work with us, not work with us, they, 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 do, the, they do the litigation. Uh, one is Mordecai Haller, who's an extremely bright individual who handles a lot of the litigation. And, uh, and then, of course, we have Israeli lawyers, Nitzana, uh, Darshan Leitner, who's the executive director as well, the founder with Avi Leitner, her husband, uh, is a key Israeli lawyer and, and really our, the centerpiece of what Shirat is all about, as well as two other Israeli lawyers who work, and then we have a third one who kind of comes in here and there, who work on uh, different cases in Israel. I mentioned to you about the Ramallah lynching case, for example. And then we also have, um, excuse me, <coughs> uh, Andrew Akiva, Akiva Hamilton, who is a Australian lawyer who does work in Australia and is looking into the enforcement actions in Europe as well. I myself, I'm the academic director. I uh, wanted to get off the Ivy Tower because it was becoming kind of, um, I want to say meaningless, but you know, it's a little bit selfish after a while. And I sort of felt I've got to do something else. I, do, I did human rights work all the time. I did work with migrant workers and refugees. And I just wanted to do something else. And this is why I got, thankfully got involved with Sharana Dean. Um, we, have a, we, we, we run on donations. Uh, I know sales pitch is hard. Uh, and I don't mean to be difficult to you guys or put you in a comfortable position. But uh, you can well imagine we do run, we do operate on donations. Um, we have uh, recently 
the ICC campaign has been somewhat costly, uh, but also we, we it was a particular case that's really difficult for us. We have, it was the America's Arab case where, uh, from about four years ago, where terrorists walked into a very woman yeshiva called America's Arab, Harav Kook, the first chief rabbi of Israel, fomenter of religious Zionism, uh, you know, se secular state with, with religious aspects, a rather interesting man who kind of straddled the, the divide, if you will, between the Haredi world and the secular world, or the, even the religious Zionist world, one could say. And the Mecca Zarab is an extremely noted institution. Uh, gunman walks in there, injures about, uh, he killed, I think, what, four people or five people, injured about 26. And we have, it's a huge case with, with tons of plaintiffs, and the other side's really smart. Uh, we're suing under the, under the Anti-Terror Act, uh, uh, actually under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And it, the other side is really smart, and they're you know forcing depositions and forcing discovery, and it's games. That's 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 part of the game. It's part of the litigation game, but it costs us a lot of. It really tore into our budget. So anything that you can uh, give to us would be great. Uh, again, I don't mean to be too pushy, but I, I would appreciate it. Um, I will also say is that I'm here uh, in the West Coast area. Uh, to uh, I'm going to be in LA. I'm going to be at UCLA tomorrow, but I'm more than happy. I'm already back. If you want to meet on Sunday and talk more, or even just have an informal brunch, as you can see, I'm a pretty laid-back guy. I like talking, and I try to also listen. I think JJ will attest to that too. Uh, I'd be more than happy to engage, and if you want to sit down and talk to me or ask me more questions. In the meantime, we also have pamphlets here, uh, which I can hand out at the end, and of course a business card, uh, which goes without saying. But if you do have questions, which I imagine, uh, you know, the Q and A is always always part of the fun. I'd be more than happy to, to take. So I'll, I'll work my way around the room and try to go a couple rounds. So I'm going to start here and then. Please. Um, how does the BDS um, com, um, impact the University of California, San Diego, and a couple of the other parts? Great question. We actually, we actually uh, it was a, about a year and a half ago, we sent a letter to all public universities. Private's obviously are different, and you run into obviously a free speech issue. All right? So, in fact, the, uh, I think it was the Holder case was the first one could assert it was, it was one of the few cases where free speech was, was pushed to the side, actually. Because, of course, it's part, free speech is going to be an argument to say, hey, I have a right of free speech, I can say what I want, and I can you know, support, and I can be hate speech here in, the, in this country, right? Unlike Europe and Israel. So, which is okay. I mean, it's, it's your cornerstone in a way. It's your bedrock of your constitution and your bill of rights. But nevertheless, um, okay, it's not good. good. <laughs> the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, but, oh yeah, so, the, so what we did is we wrote to every single public university and we said, look, there's a very fine line going on here because you reach a point of, uh, of discrimination and, and I'm not getting into that is anti-Israel, anti-Semitic, but what we found is under the State Department regulations, definition of anti-Semitism, which was a major issue in the world about five years ago, you know, it always goes like this, and there was huge anti rise in anti-Semitism in Europe happened last year, so this is a five years ago it happened. They had it. So the so State Department came out with the definition. And they actually said uh, something along the lines of that it anti while, whilst anti-Israel sentiment is not necessarily anti-Semitism, it go, runs very close and eventually can slough into that murky water of anti-Semitism, and you should be aware. You know, one of those directives, you should be aware of them. So we wrote to the public university and we said, look, you, of course, have the right of free speech, but be aware of the fact that if you go too far, you are going to be subject yourself to lawsuit uh, as, as discriminatory actions. The issue, of course, is academic freedom and free speech. And, and obviously, yes, and obviously that, that, that you, know, you have to allow, not I have to, but I, you have to for the framework. I'm not here to destroy the system, uh, hopefully change it, but you have to allow for that type of framework to exist, i.e., to allow for free speech on a certain level to occur. So. Uh, but uh, what we have found is, for example, with regard to, I'll give you an example, pension fund in New York wants to divest all Israeli, they actually voted to divest all Israeli uh, uh, investments you know, from their pension fund. And you can imagine the teaching fund, the pension fund of New York is, is no small change, that, that's serious money. Uh, and, and again, I'm not saying it's going to affect Israel, but I'm saying is that it's, pow it's strong, they have a, a leverage. And, uh, we wrote to them. We said, "Look, your 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 public body, your you know, your, uh, what do you call it, New York State education system, and uh, you have to be extremely careful as to what you're doing. And, and uh, arguably, you can define that as a discriminatory action. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's something we're looking into, but it's something to take into account. That that's the type of avenues that we're going to try to take on this one. I don't know how far it will go, but the obviously the Civil Rights Act and the discrimination actions 
clearly worth, uh, and in the boycott context, were, have been upheld by courts. I mean, it's, not, it's not a new thing to uphold the civil rights statutes, you know, and to say, oh, it prevents me from free speech. But there's a certain level, right, that you slough into that you, even free speech can be limited on a, cer on a certain level. Uh, you had your hand up, I think. Yes. Um, sure. If I understood you correctly, if the Palestinians make the argument that Israel has violated international law, I think that Israel has the opportunity in a very strong case against Hamas for all that they've done, right, for uh, war crimes, etc. Yeah. Why is Israel not pursuing that anyway? I'll tell you why. <coughs> Good question. Very astute. The answer is, is because Israel doesn't, if Israel would invoke the jurisdiction of the ICC, then, then Israel would be subject to the full gamut of the ICC actions. It depend, it's, the, it's the invoking state or entity uh, that then has, now I'll put it this way. Here's Israel, here's Gaza. Okay, well, there's something like this. That's <laughs> close enough. The jurisdiction being invoked here is vis-a-vis -vis Gaza. Once you invoke that jurisdiction, you're opening yourself up to any types of actions in Gaza. If Israel says, okay, we're going to sue UPA, so then Israel's opening itself up to any type of actions vis-a-vis -vis the ICC with regard to Israel, and Israel doesn't want to do that. For whatever reasons might exist, I think the main concern is is that they're, they're worried about, obviously, politi politicization, if you will. And I know, uh, of the ICC, I mean. And, and it's you know somewhat venerable, but it's still subject, to, it easily can be subject to actions. And, and you know we don't want to have our generals sitting in, in The Hague for no apparent reason. It's in prison in The Hague for, for no reason. That, why should there be other uh, crazy dictators should be placed into there? That's really the purpose of it. Um, so that, that's, that's really what the distinction that goes here. Sure. Anything else? Uh, JJ, you had? I saw you taking notes down. So I was yeah, right. Uh, to fo follow up on, on uh, his question, uh, my understanding is, is that precisely what you said, for a state to uh, fall under the jurisdiction of the court, of the uh, International Criminal Court, they have to have signed the Treaty of Rome. Yeah. Correct. And ratified it, or either way, uh, which Israel, of course, has not done. So the Palestinians can sue all they want, Israel is not a party to the Treaty of Rome. It right. is not subject to the International okay. Criminal Court. Good, good question. Because the way it works is the jurisdiction of the court, the way it works is that if a, a court, let's say Gaza or let's say another state, make it easier, the state, state A and state B. If state B invokes the jurisdiction, then the actions conducted by state A on the, in the area of state B also fall within that jurisdiction because it's within the jurisdiction of the state itself. You understand? In other words, if state A if whatever it was, B or A. State A has not signed the ICC statute, so cannot be. However, if it sends its soldiers into the area of State B, which has signed, then it's subjected to the jurisdiction of the ICC court vis-a-vis -vis the actions that were conducted in State B. Okay, second question. Does the status of the uh, uh, Palestine between brackets as an observer state, right. That does enough of a it's, n it's yeah. not a full state. It's right. not so a sovereign it's, it's nation. It's a really good question. And it, it's based on two things. One is based on the desire of the ICC to uh, incorporate as many actors as they can into the fold, if you will, mm -hmm. which would allow for autonomous regions. You know, think of Kosovo, think of Kurdistan, to use an example. Uh, even Kosovo before it was officially made, uh, recognized or, or declared as a state. Uh, so there's those areas, that, the notion is that you want to be as, as over-inclusive as you can, or try to be. And the second reason is is that the um, yes, it's it's on the Vienna Con hardcore Vienna Convention law of treaties. I think that's what you're getting at. That does apply, but that doesn't discount the fact that other entities can sign onto a treaty if the treaty allows for it. I mean, now, maybe it might be outside of Vienna Convention law, it could be customary international law. Uh, but the answer is is that the, the pursuant to the way the chief prosecutor interpreted the ICC uh, statute, so it allows for some type of. Uh, 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 signature by even by observer nations probably parentheses probably because they have intentions to declare statehood and have been recognized by the general assembly a petition plan you know I, UN 181 all these different things there. I actually I don't want to monopolize the, the legal discussion but uh, yeah, I know if you get really nasty <laughs> yeah uh, 
I wasn't going to go uh, to the Vienna Convention. I wanted to talk about the Montevideo Convention, mm -hmm. which defines the criteria mm -hmm. for a state, a state right. to be recognized, right. and Palestine doesn't meet those criteria. Right, right. That, that is, that's, that's a hardcore <coughs> argument. Uh, I, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to answer that because it will take me about ten, five, five to seven minutes to answer and be ashamed. No, no offense. <laughs> no, and understand. if we do at the end, I gladly will address that. Okay. And it's really not to belittle the question, but it just, it's going to, I, I want to do it properly, and I don't want it to be, it, so forgive it's a, me. It's a fascinating topic. It's a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Actually, by the way, Avi Bell wrote a whole uh, uh, analysis of that, by the oh, way. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, but an interesting one. Okay. Just for the, I know he's a local UCS. Yeah. Uh, we'll go there, uh, there, there, and then there. So, yeah, please. Our settlers are now in a, quote, unquote, in, 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 a, in a state or whatever it is, state of Palestine. How are they going to be defined now? Who the, you, the, the, oh. or the Israelis that they live in settlements, right? In a Palestinian right. now defined whatever it whatever is. Whatever it is, right? How well, are that's they going the thing. to be classified? Now? Right. So, so they, you know, the the Palestine Palestinian Authority, let's say, is not yet a state. So those areas are still subject to whatever it is you want to say. Like I think that's what JJ was getting at. Uh, with regard to, you know, are they about to be there? How do you define resolution, Security Council Resolution 242? Is it the territories or just territories? Thereby leaving it in a very broad manner as to whether Israel can allow for its population to, to, to move in to these Judea Samaria, disputed area, occupied territories, whatever you want to call it. In other words, until there is a formal declaration of statehood... Um, they belong to Israel? Well, they don't belong, they're, they're, they're it's kind of what's called in the law sui generis, which is neither nishtan here, nishtan there, to use in Yiddish, you know, neither here nor there. What I'm getting at is, is that it, it's... Well, uh, do, do they fall under the jurisdiction of Palestine? Or okay, so this is the answer. So, first of all, interesting footnote again. I'm sorry to give you so many footnotes, but yeah, I'm academic, you know. Uh, you know, the Palestinian Authority was created by the Oslo Accords. It's actually, arguably, an entity of the Israeli army. <laughs> I always love that one. I, know, yeah. I always love that. Nobody, we, forget, we tend to forget that. Sorry. Um, you lost me. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer you properly. The answer is as follows. Uh, with regard to the treatment of the settlements, the areas that are now controlled by Israel, military controlled by Israel, forget Ramallah, which is in the Palestinian Authority, uh, are, have never been, the Israeli argument, have never been subject to a sovereign entity. And as a result, they're amorphous. It's mean. It doesn't. Who knows what they are? But there's no way. It doesn't mean that that Israel can annex it. it. Doesn't mean that the Palestinians can control it. What it means is that until it's decided, let's say a peace peace treaty between Israel and Palestine, uh, the, the delineation of borders, the settlements are the area, disputed area, Judea Samaria, are just you know areas under eventual statehood for Palestine and maybe for Israel as well. That's the argument that Israel makes. It's called, it's called a non-reversion, there's no reversionary, reversionary sovereign. There's no somebody to turn back to. Why? What was it before? Ottoman Empire. That was by no means would you consider that a sovereign as such. In fact, as we know from the history, it kind of rejected Palestine. Just read Mark Twain. 18, you know, he, Mark Twain went around Palestine during the, during, if you will, Kind of the end, tail end of the Ottoman Empire was already bankrupt in a certain level. But it was desolate. They didn't even care. In fact, during the first Aliyah of the Jews in 1856, the Ottomans didn't even, don't worry about it, do what you want type of thing, until they woke up during the Ali Pasha in the beginning of the World War I and said, oh, oh, whoa, whoa, sorry. And then they started shutting everything down and, you know, all these different things that happened. But prior to that, they were, it was pretty loosey-goosey in terms of the Ottoman Empire and the Jews and Palestine itself. They, they almost would, I wouldn't say they neglected it, but they didn't really pay much attention to it. Along comes the mandate, League of Nations, trust territory, never a sovereign, never declared a sovereign. In other words, it's still, don't, and also don't forget, post-World War I, post-World War II, creation of all the Arab states, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Hashemite Kingdom, of course, existed beforehand. In fact, they controlled Mecca and Medina for many times. They, 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 were, they were sitting pretty because they, they sort of saw themselves as the new holy rulers of the earth until the Wahhabis came in and said, bye. <laughs> but until that period of time, that whole area, and by the way, which also included, of course, if you will, East and West Bank, Jordania made up stuff in 1950. But it, it was a huge swath of area, which went all the way into, over into Judea Samaria. And, uh, and, and as a result of it never being <coughs> held by a sovereign, the argument goes, um, it's, it's, it's not, Israel's presence there is not illegal. I'll leave it like that, I'll put it like that. Now, that's, by the way, that's the underpinning of the policy of the United States, to their credit, is that if you looked at why the, why the U.S. 
and, and Hillary Clinton said this. If you look at, and, and previous state, uh, uh, Secretary of State also said this. If you look at why the U.S. said is we don't want to have Palestine declare itself an observer uh, a nation now with a view towards achieving statehood, et cetera, et cetera, is because the peace process has to be worked out first. They have to achieve peace between the two sides, and then they can move towards statehood. Otherwise, it will just be chaotic and silly. And, and, that's, and, and your question is getting at the root of that. I hope that's clear what I just said. It, but that's, that's what they're getting at. Hold on, I have a hand there. I, I will go over to you as well. You don't like that argument, but yeah, please. Yeah, I'm a little confused. You've won significant amounts of money in legal suits. It seems to me I'd be rolling in money. Ah, great question. We don't take it. We give it to the terrorists. We take, sometimes we take money if it was a huge expense that we just can't afford, like, you know, I'll give you an example. If, if there's a motion to dismiss on a case, it could cost us something like 250 Are there any lawyers in the room? You guys, anybody earning $500 an hour? These, these lawyers get paid big money, $800 an hour. But the, uh, how have I by all of us? <laughs> but the, uh, for example, to defend the motion to dismiss could cost us $250,000. Uh, to make the connection between the, the, um, the terror group and the actual action, and then with the fact that the money is going towards that terror group, it, it takes investigation, takes uh, obviously uh, testimony, affidavits, etc., cetera, et cetera, and, and we have to pay people to do that. Um, but like I said, we don't take the money uh, unless it's for a you know, certain percentage is, is given towards expenses. The contingency fee is given to the American lawyer who's not affiliated with us. You know, he's work, obviously working with us, he's a great guy. Uh, but we, our organization, we give it straight to the terror victims. And that's why, uh, let's say, of that 130 million, probably about 100 million or 80 million, 90 million went to terror victims' families and, and you know, people. All right, so I hope that answers. I, I saw a hand here, then I saw your hand, but it was there first. So I'm going to go there, there, and there, if that's okay. Please. About uh, the, the situation in the, in the, uh, in the PA, uh, they keep saying that uh, all the settlements are illegal. Why, why doesn't Israel really fight more about... Yeah, interesting question. They had a, uh, actually, Baker... Because everybody says it, it's illegal. It's illegal, and therefore it's accepted as being illegal. I know. Illegal. Everybody I accepts know. it as illegal. What I do know. you mean? Partially it's from the, from the International Court of... Our good friends at the International Court of Justice uh, on the separation wall case, which is, again, another, another discussion, maybe, <laughs> for another time. Um, uh, you should be aware of the, the ICJ is and I say this without any hesitation, is a political body. The International Court of Justice is by no means, we might perceive it as a court, but it's not a court. It's, it's state representatives who are sitting there as sort of judges or adjudicators to decide on, to make statements and declarations about what international law is. I'm saying that because in the separation wall case, they were very clear in saying, is, oh, settlers, settlements, they're, they're illegal under international law. But they, they uh, A, did not account for at all, account for the Israeli uh, uh, contention that I was just giving to you about reversionary sovereign. Uh, the if you look at uh, and you might find this interesting. I see. I, I tell you, Israeli, huh? You're Israeli, yes? Yeah, okay. Of so you can read it in Hebrew. I'm just mentioning that not to embarrass you, but more that you'll find it interesting to read. Uh, the the, the pr prime minister, I think it was about a year and a half ago, uh, asked um, uh, 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 Ambassador Baker, who was a former ambassador to Canada, who was formerly the head of the Foreign Ministry Legal Office. Uh, um, Got two other individuals, forgive me. Uh, gosh, uh, one judge was a Sephardi of Sephardi origin. I forgot his name, forgive me. He was an ex justice, and then a third individual as well. And uh, uh, Levy, Levy, that's was not, 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 yes, he was, it was really, he's, he's from Beersheba. Levy uh, was another justice, Levy, and Baker, and a third individual. And they issued a very interesting report regarding the Israeli, uh, Israeli approach towards settlements to say that it's not necessary, it's not illegal under, under international law. You can take a look at it. Just look at labor reports, settlements. And they have a summary in English, and you can get to the, you find, the, you find it very interesting. And it goes to those, kind of those arguments that I was just talking about. Yeah, but um, I'm saying it kind you're of... You're saying it's toughest, why don't they... Yeah. So, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They should make so much more... More of a fuss about it. A fuss about it. Come yeah, on. you know, it's funny. JJ and I were talking about that. Is it's the distinction between in Israel we're sort of positivist, you know, very legal oriented, and and we kind of give cold empirical, you know, tafas, short tachtonit kaze. You know, what's going to really happen? Uh, I'm sorry, what's really happening? And then you get 
somebody else in the news say, oh yes, but I was killed and my brother was killed and the Israeli soldiers killed us and they, you know, we were throwing stones and they're shooting at us bullets. Yeah. And you don't gain anything from that. So I'm saying it's part of that as well. That we, I think our, you know, I'm very comfortable as a lawyer to have arguments being made by Baker uh, pursuant to the way I see uh, international law is, is meant to be defined. And you know, I'm very happy with that, but I'm sure it's not effective enough. Uh, in other parts, and you're, you're right, you're right. You're, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I just, I don't know, Hasbara, I don't know about that. I don't know. You had a question? Yes. Uh, I wanted to uh, go back to the first question. Sure. Um, and being that you're the academic side of the That's what I claim, yeah. yeah. But, you know, you would be more related to the academia in that sense. Um, uh, here in California, we have the uh, uh, UC system. Yes, it has been like uh, like uh, a domino effect, in, uh, especially in divestment. Then they have the uh, uh, quite high week going on, and other things. Um, you've been telling us a lot about how creative you've been in many other areas. Right? You know academia very well. You know what we're facing. The question I have is two questions. One, how can it be applied? For instance, the defamation of being apartheid, mm -hmm. telling someone you're apartheid when they're not. Uh, we just had an example over in uh, Canada of a student arguing and actually banning yeah. apartheid week. Yeah, I saw so that's that, like actually. a little a bit literally of what you guys are doing. Somebody from Canada. So number one, how can we apply that? Number two, would you help us if we found the money for you? To do. All right. Okay. Got it. Okay. Got it. <laughs> okay. So uh, first of all, it's hard to compare Canada to the United States because it's really, you guys are the real problem. Here, not problem. I don't mean to be this. The problem is freedom of speech. You have an extremely broad notion of freedom of speech. Probably one of the few places in the world that are like that. Europe clearly is not for its obvious history. is not going to allow for the free speech that you guys allow for. And and Canada is obviously similar. By the way, England as well. You, you, if I told you what the free speech. Uh, 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 boundaries are in, in England, you, you would be shocked because it's tiny, it's narrow, it's really small. And Canada is similar ish, similar to England, obviously, because of the Commonwealth and its connection. Now, uh, with regard to the, uh, the apartheid week really does bother me. It's funny you say that because I came across an article uh, uh, that was actually published a while, not a while back, but a good couple, yeah, maybe eight years ago, a bit more, uh, by, yeah, about eight years by a Palestinian, which was which is said in the Pal I think it was Palestinian yearbook or something like that, which basically says that uh, no way is Israel an apartheid state, <laughs> and it went it was pretty impressive. I mean, the truth is he was trying to get at a different point to say it was worse, but the arguments that he was making was kind of boom boom shooting himself in the foot with regard to apartheid. Um, I'm saying this is because actually in the intern program, I plan on having the students this summer work on that. I want to work on that too. I agree with you. I think there's got to be a way of delegitimizing entirely that very notion of comparing Israel to an apartheid state. And it's, it's Espe especially when you have a centralized UC, you don't have to go to each one. Right. Right. If you scare them enough, right. they'll just right. say, hey, you guys stop it, we're going to be tough. You know? right. right. So so that's that's a start of what we're doing with regard to that. Top is thinking about of what actions that we can file uh, with regard to the, with regard to, um, it, it, I think that the way I would see it is, and, and I have to be quite honest, you said I'm academic, but I'm not a litigator, <laughs> uh, is uh, actual damage being done to an individual. So that then you could say is, uh, you, you see, are allowing these activities, in fact, you're supporting, right? Because it's student money, and bodies, right? It's the whole, I know the whole, I know the game. Uh, because it's, it's, you, it's your tax money going to support organizations. That, in essence, that's really what's happening. You see, it's right public. Uh, that someone either, either not necessarily get physically injured, but we, we need somebody to come forward and say, you know what, I, I was injured by this, uh, emotional distress, uh, you know, I was pushed at the rally, you know, stuff like that. Whereby, then you could have a cause of action and say, look, there's real damages here, free speech or not, it's similar to, if you will, healing fire in a crowded uh, theater. You know, it's the whole idea that there are limitations. So, that's the angle, uh, personally, that's the angle I'll take. We try to find people to do that for us. At one, one stage, I think Rutgers was very close to that. They had an issue there. It wasn't, I don't think it was a part-time week, but there was some other issue going on. But there was no real like action going on. By the way, we took the same approach with regard to, we were really close with regard to the unions. When they were, they, at one stage, I don't know if you remember, they, they, you guys in Oakland, up north, not you guys, I'm sorry, California, sorry, sorry. Um, they, they refused to unload a uh, Zim, Zim uh, a freighter. And, uh, and, and arguably, we, 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 it was hard to file, but 
again, it was hard to get Zoom to say, yeah, we had damages because it was only one day delay. So, we're, you know, maybe a thousand dollars. You know, it wasn't like a big thing. So that's the bottom. That's the bottom line with regard to that is to get to have somebody who actually has damages, and then on that basis move it forward with regard to uh, with regard to uh, uh, challenging these type of actions against UC. I happen to agree with you. And the truth is, you, you gave me an idea is that that maybe we can uh, s we can start looking at it a little a, a little bit more. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about UC the, and its yeah, structure. You claim, hear what I'm saying? The claim they had in Canada was that by implication. They were implied to be racist by right. by since I have my right. brothers and sisters in Israel. Okay, right. I have, actually have family. You know, by saying that it's an apartheid state, you tell I me. Mean, so you know, so that's what. It, maybe it's not for here. Maybe we'll talk about. We it can later. talk about it after. But no, but I'll tell you something. Yeah. I'll tell you something. You're 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 if you will barking up. Uh, you know, in Canada also the anti. They have, again, they have a different type of structure with regard to racial what they call racialist racial laws. Uh, Prussia because of their history. Yeah, you know they, they clearly were not very nice to the First Nations. You know the whole the whole business there. Um, so they they kind of have this grounds for that. <clears throat> but you are you are uh, getting uh, you are getting me thinking because what I think should be done is now that I'm thinking about it more is you see system and look at its structure and look at its infrastructure and look at how it operates and that might be very uh, that might be something to bar to look yeah, into. And there I, might I, be somewhere there might be a crack. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking I'm thinking of maybe in the in the, in the context of a um, of a uh, uh, of uh, what do you call it uh, as an internship project to start the ball rolling. So I, I want to jump in here because there is a case uh, uh, in, in in under in, underway in the courts right now. I think it was two years ago. A young Jewish woman, her name is Jessica Felber, was pushed violently by a Palestinian mm -hmm. uh, student with a with a shopping cart. Mm -hmm. He rammed her. As part of the apartheid As week, part of uh, the, uh, yeah, the, in the demonstration. And they do a fake and, type thing. Right? And, and, and she sued the uh, uh, Berkeley. That's awesome. It was a uh, Berkeley. So I don't know where it is now, but that is something that, that uh, I can put you in touch with her, actually. She's a student at uh, UCLA, I believe, right now. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. And, really? Uh, a law student or? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. She's she's uh, uh, majoring oh. in Israel uh, she studies. Can put me in touch, but, awesome. but uh, yeah, she can tell you where where I don't know where the lawsuit is. We could, but but uh, yeah. she she. I mean, sued. it sounds like a tort action rather than. I yeah. think What we're getting at here is to sort of cut cut it out. You know, deracinate this very movement, which is fine. Don't get me wrong. It's good to do tort action. If no, it's no, gonna, absolutely. But. I, I, I believe more in the deracination. T TB is right. Uh, I, I agree. I agree entirely with his approach. I think we should be a lot, a lot more <coughs> proactive, and especially the defamation uh, all angle. The of all of us here. Right. Well, anyway, there was a question from here. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure. Oh, you might have I think you left. You left. Uh, you didn't seem too happy with my answer. I was looking forward. No, no, he's a good friend. I'm joking. I'm joking yeah, around. He's a good guy. Like, you like you a, if they say that, that it's a apartheid state, show me where it's a, it's a apartheid. Right, apartheid. exactly. Apartheid. Otherwise, it's defamation. I know, I know. That, that's, that's really what we're... See, the defamation... Yeah, the problem is you need to prove uh, damages by the defamation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the defamation. It's funny because, again, the defamation, you want to hear something unbelievable? And like in England, it's almost the exact opposite. If you sue for defamation, the defendant has to demonstrate how it's not. It's, yeah. it's, because yeah. of yellow journalism, tabloid journalism, and stuff like that. Well, that's to London, so. <laughs> London, Ontario. <laughs> but the no, no, you don't have to move to London. You, there's too much beautiful sun here. Other questions? And great beaches. Just one, please. Um, if a TV station helps promote terror, mm -hmm. can you go after them? That's a great question. You know, we tried. Uh, yeah, arguably yes. We tried with regard to, and this wasn't under the anti-terror act. Um, during the Second Lebanese, uh, Second Lebanese War, I think, uh, the um, Al Jazeera was, we allowed them to broadcast in Israel. And what they were doing was that they were, they were, they were, not, uh, uh, they were not honoring our censors because what happens is that the Hezbollah, when they were shooting tons of rockets on the oh, northern yeah. part of Israel, uh, the more they saw on the news, uh, the, the better they became. Uh, more accurate, if you will, they adjusted. Mm -hmm. And Al Jazeera was, in essence, yeah. that kind of yeah. providing them with a lot of information. So we said to them, stop, stop doing that. Uh, you know, you're subject to military censor, obviously, during wartime. Not that you shouldn't broadcast, but don't show all the... And they kind of didn't listen. We tried to sue them as supporters, therefore, of supporters of Hezbollah, yeah. 
and the court dismissed that one. And not because of material support, but for a bunch of other reasons that was it was dismissed sadly. Well, but your definition of terrorism was that it terrorizes citizens. Right. But it's not my definition. It's not, it's not okay. the, I've just taken from the but terror law and your security yeah. council resolution. So. Yeah, but but yeah. yeah, yeah, I hear you on that. Uh, yeah, it was just it was dismissed for other reasons. Uh, and it was, the court basis it was too attenuated. Interesting, again, footnote, you'll find this interesting, maybe, it's, and give me one more second and I'll stop here, is that the, the, uh, the same thing happened during uh, the recent Gaza action, where there were Twitter feeds uh, um, being, and, and we were going to say as well, from Hamas, and we were going to say as well, Twitter should stop allowing for Hamas, similar idea. We did because, apparently, the... Israeli intelligence was relying on this Twitter feed <laughs> because they could locate the guys. Oh. <laughs> so we didn't, but it's, it's a similar idea to what you're saying. So yeah, TV, uh, TV is an interesting group. Uh, yeah, sure. Any other question? Anybody? Current. Current, the new uh, television show bought by um, the Vice President. Al Gore. Al Gore. Al Gore. Al Gore. Al Gore. Yeah, he oh, he sold it. I know he did. He sold it, right? I, yeah. Or he's on the board. Yeah. That's because it was an environmentally wise choice. <laughs> <laughs> but the the problem is here, but that uh, now Al Jazeera is applying with all the major uh, cable networks uh, to 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 be aired in America, and it has received permission. So now it's up to the networks, and I just read that Time Warner was the first one who turned them down. Really? To their credit. Uh, now we're waiting for the others. What are they going to do about this? Right. Anyway. So uh, I want uh, to thank uh, Leonard. Uh, thank I you. don't know about you. <laughs> Maybe it's because this is also my field. I absolutely loved it. Uh, yeah. every, every word of it was very, very interesting, fascinating. Uh, I want to thank you very much. Uh, I also want to point out one thing. Um, you know, here in, in, in San Diego and in other Jewish communities, it's usually not the practice for a nonprofit to sponsor or support another one. <laughs> I go totally against that, that uh, trend. Thank you. uh, you're most welcome. Uh, I think that uh, Shorat Hadin are doing a fabulous job. They are totally deserving of all our, our support. So uh, I'm not embarrassed at all that uh, you know he made a call for anybody to support. I think it's, it's an organization that is very, very worthy of supporting. Uh, you were saying that you've been with their mission. They have a mission, two missions every year. Yes, we have and, uh, pamphlets. Is, is oh, a, good. Yeah. And, and you've been with them three times? Three times, oh, and I'll yeah. actually be joining them a fourth time in uh, June. So th I think that is a good incentive for me to go also with them. Uh, <laughs> good. Uh, probably good. will, because good. it's very, very good. Awesome. Yeah, you're really, yeah. it's very interesting, our missions. We, It'll be different than any trip you've ever been on. Seriously, right? sure. we get you into really good places, the Kiriya, and you know, and you meet really interesting people and former uh, prime minister spokesmen, things like that. If you get insight, if you will, insight information, but an insight into what is really security, really what, what I guess the issues that we face, right, with Israeli security, you'll see it firsthand. It's pretty stark. So it'll be in your face. So <coughs> if you want to stay uh, and talk to Leonard, he, he's made himself av available. So uh, you're welcome to. Pleasure. And uh, uh, pamphlets as well. Thank you. Great, great. Tell them about the two lectures that we have, the other two lectures. Oh, yes. We have two more lectures coming up. Uh, on May 9th, we have Professor Mordecai Kedar from, I think, one of Ben Gurion University. He is considered the most uh, knowledgeable Arabist in, uh, in Israel. Uh, uh, and uh, on May 21st, we have um, Cameron Brown. Some of you know him. He's a local son, so to speak, but he made Aliyah a number of years ago, and he is a very, very knowledgeable uh, academic slash journalist slash political analyst what have you very very interesting too and for those of you who happen to be lost in Bonita tomorrow uh, tomorrow night I'm giving a lecture on the Arab Spring at the congregation Beth Eliyahu uh, if you have nothing better to do thank you so much bye bye thank you. Thank you.